great. So with that, we will begin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this session led by Bates Wells in conjunction with Bond and A4ID. This morning, we will be considering the recent DFID FCO merger. We realise that this is a very relevant topic and that many NGOs have questions about their existing arrangements with DFID. In this session, we can help you understand the implications of the merger for your DFID grant agreements and contracts, as well as your rights and your options. For those who don't know me, I'm Letitia Jennings. I'm a partner in Bateswell's dispute resolution and litigation team, where I lead on a variety of contentious matters for charities, including many NGOs. I have much experience of dealing with DFID and disputes involving DFID. And I've also got much experience of successfully resolving disputes with DFID on behalf of NGOs. I'm joined this morning by Samara Lawrence. Samara is a solicitor in Bateswell's charity and social enterprise team. Samara is fully familiar with DFID's terms and conditions and she advises NGOs on all of their dealings with DFID, including their subcontracts for DFID service contracts. And prior to joining Bates Wells, Samara spent six months as at Plan International in their in-house legal team. This morning, Samara and I will be aided by a set of slides Please don't worry about taking notes because after the session, Bond will be sharing all of the slides with you. This session is being recorded and similarly, Bond will make sure all delegates receive a recording of this session. There is, as ever on Zoom, a chat functionality at the bottom of your screen. There's also a Q&A functionality. We do have time in this session for Q&A. So please, as the um, session ensues, please do type in your questions. We'll be monitoring that regularly and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. Because of time constraints, we won't be able to get through all of them, but at the very end of the session, I'll give you details of how you can put any questions to us that unfortunately we haven't had time to go over in this session. Before Samara and I begin in earnest, I should put this session into context. The UK economy has already contracted and is expected to contract further in the coming months. For the first time in 11 years, the UK is officially in recession, reducing the gross national income or the GNI and therefore the amounts that the UK's 0.7% contribution to overseas development aid represents. The UK government has announced a £2.9 billion package of cuts to UK aid spending for 2020 as part of the ODA reduction process. And it's also expecting UK aid direct budget reductions of 25% financial year end 2021. In addition, as many of us know, it has been a long held desire of the current UK Prime Minister to do away with DFID as a standalone organisation. Boris Johnson has long sought to um, bring the whole of the UK's international offering under one diplomatic focused umbrella and therefore it's no surprise to many of us that within just a few months of um, him winning a majority at the 2019 election he announced that he would be folding it into the FCO. Following that announcement earlier this year, DFID and the FCO have now merged to create the newly formed Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, or the FCOD. For ease, during this session, we will continue to refer to DFID and your DFID contracts and grant agreements because we technically are at least four. On the 
2nd of September, the newly formed FCDO sent a letter to supply partners. I know many of you received a copy of that letter and a copy is on the slide. Will be now, there we go. Thank you um, to Samara who is uh, doing all of the tech this morning so that I don't have to. Um, this letter sets out the short-term implications of the merger in terms of procurement and commercial practice. The letter is very complementary to supply partners and in my view it is an attempt to keep you all on side whilst the government figures out what on earth it's going to do next and how matters are going to be arranged in the future. But importantly, the letter makes it clear that for now at least, there will be no changes to existing contracts or grant funding agreements under UK law, although I think that's very much a short term um, state of affairs and we must all be vigilant to changes in the coming months. Thanks, Letitia. Um, so first of all, just before we get into things, just to talk quickly about the different types of funding agreements that you might have with DFID. Um, so as you'll be aware, DFID has historically partnered with a diverse range of organisations and it's um, channeled its funds through different funding instruments, depending on the project. Uh, so these funding instruments include grants, uh, memorandums of understanding and increasingly service contracts. Um, You'll be aware DFID also has framework contracts um, with agreed suppliers, and these are those multi-year contracts um, under which a number of um, partners can become preferred suppliers for a specific area or expertise, and then projects are issued to these suppliers under call-off contracts. Um, I think because we're assuming the vast majority of you will be um, using service contracts or these or DFID accountable grant agreements. Um, we're just going to focus on those two today, but just to flag that some of the principles that I'll cover um, regarding variations of service contracts under the procurement rules, and these also apply to the framework agreements. Um, and as we move through, and I'll flag this later, just to, to keep in your mind the distinction between the standard terms and conditions in those service contracts and DFID accountable grant agreements, um, but I'll cover that a bit later. Um, and as Atish has mentioned, you know, we've, we've had this confirmation from the FCDO that the terms on which your funding arrangements are set will remain unchanged, but it's, you know, we think it's very likely that in the future that they, the FCDO will seek to amend or vary the terms and conditions of these funding arrangements. And, and some of you have already seen um, for the UK aid direct funded projects um, that you've been asked to find reductions of 25% um, in this financial year. And so what we want to do today is first of all, just take you through the different um, provisions in these agreements. So first of all, looking at the variation provisions that MDFID um, might invoke and thinking about your, your rights to um, request, uh, to resist requests to alter the terms of the agreement and looking at the UK's procurement rules. Um, we'll also be looking at the termination rights that DFID can invoke in your agreements um, and looking at the two different options. Um, and then also um, thinking about what your options are if DFID does choose to invoke either of these provisions, what you can do. And Letitia is going to talk you through the dispute resolution procedure. And then we'll also look um, at some practical actions as well. So first of all, just beginning with um, DFID standard terms and conditions. So these are the service contracts. Um, so you'll probably be aware that um, all of DFID, DFID supply partners are required to accept standard terms and conditions. Um, and often there'll be special conditions which are attached to these standard terms and conditions. Um, we won't be covering the special conditions today just because that these are unique to each project or contractor. Um, but just as flag that usually they cover things like data sharing, um, payments, key personnel, and, and also sometimes specific termination provisions. So it's important just to make sure that you're familiar with both the terms, standard terms and conditions and also your special conditions and to look out in the future for potentially additional provisions being inserted into those special conditions. And I would flag that you've usually got more scope to negotiate the special conditions than you do with the standard, standard terms and conditions. And so different service contracts, um, these contracts, most of them will fall within the scope of the Public Contracts Regulations 2015. And these regulations, they cover the circumstances in which variations to existing contracts can be made without DFID having to start a new procurement procedure. 
Um, and the purpose of these regulations essentially is to limit the, the, the scope of the changes that can be made to a contract which has been issued by a public body after the tender process has been completed. And DFID and the FCDO, um, it, they were considered to be a public body and as a result um, they're required to comply with the public procurement regulations if they use a procurement or a contracted route um, to tender a contract and that contract reaches the relevant threshold levels. Um, I won't cover what those thresholds are, but just to be aware if you're considering whether these regulations apply, the first step is to make sure that your contract falls within that relevant threshold. And so what the procurement laws do um, is they essentially they preclude a substantive material change to contract terms without the contracting authority, so in this case um, DFID or the FCDO, having to initiate a new procurement process. Um, and the reason for this is that they're trying to stop contracting bodies from making changes to a contract for discriminatory reasons. So, for example, after the tender process has been completed, actually awarding a supplier <clears throat> more work um, or making the terms more commercially attractive after the bid has been completed. And what the DFID standard terms and conditions do is they reflect these regulations by enabling variations to be made to the contract so long as the part so long as the variation does not amount to a material change of the contract and um, so of course and helpfully there's not really a definition of what material changes if you look at the um the definition section of the terms and conditions what it does is it refers to its meaning um, within the law and the uk's procurement regulations and what these regulations do is they set out that a substantial change to a contract, irrespective of its value, is one which meets one of the following conditions. And I've set those out on the slide, but um, the conditions are, does it materially alter the character of the original contract or framework? Um, would the change have allowed other potential suppliers to participate or be selected or another tender to be accepted? Does it change the economic balance in favor of the contractor? Um, does it extend the scope of the contract or framework considerably? And then also, you know, does, is there a new contractor replacing the initial, the original contractor other than where that was already provided for in the contract or there's, for example, a takeover or insolvency? Um, but just a flag, that's only for the, if the contractor is replaced and so not the contracting authority, which in this case would be DIVIS. So the, the merger with DIFID and the FCO won't trigger um, a material change in and of itself. But I guess it's looking back and thinking, um, has there been a material, what would considered you consider to be a material change? I and mean, it might be something that you, you think you're very clear on. But I guess one of the things I would think about is um, if you look at the, the option which says, does it extend the scope of the contract? There is case law which also suggests that if um, there's been a significant reduction in the services that you're providing, um, then that would also amount to a material change. Um, but again, I think it's, a, it's in case law, it's, you know, the facts are specific. So again, taking legal advice if you think that that would, one would apply. And I think also with the reduction of services, what it might do is trigger the second one, which is, does it allow other, would it have allowed other potential suppliers to participate um, in that tender process? So the kind of the two are, are linked there. And then thinking about has there been a change in the economic balance in favor of the contractor? So I guess thinking about has there been a significant change in the risk profile of the contract? Um, is the contract now, you know, potentially more valuable or less valuable? Um, and so the consequences of there being material change to the contract is that the contracting authority must start a new procurement process for that service. Um, and arguably, you probably think, actually, that's not really what I want to achieve from this. Um, I don't want the contract to go to back to procurement. And, and I don't think DFID um, or the FCDO would either. So it's an option you can take to DFID to suggest that there may have been material change and to apply some pressure to them. But it's a fine line to tread because ultimately they could take the contract back to procurement. Um, okay, so that's if there's been a material change, and I guess moving on to if there has, um, if the change is not substantial um, or material, then what DFID's standard terms and conditions state is that the variation um, must first be agreed by both the parties, and it also must have a formal technical and commercial justification. So, first of all, you're going to be wanting for that evidence of what is the technical justification for the change and the commercial justification from the change from DFID. I think probably in this environment they won't struggle to give you a commercial justification given the, the cuts. 
Um, but their options are, so if you choose not to accept the variation that they propose, um, is that they can either choose to agree to continue to perform the contract without variation, or they have an option to terminate the agreement with immediate effect, with the exception of where you as the supplier have already fulfilled part or all of the provision of services, or where you can, as a supplier, can show evidence of substantial work being carried out to provide the services under the contract. And um, Letitia will talk about this a bit later in more detail, but um, if you can't come to an agreement with DFID, then there is um, the option to go down the dis uh, dispute resolution procedure. So now just thinking about if you have been presented with a change, what are the, you know, the practical things you can do about negotiating that variation um, with DFID or the FCDO? So essentially the first thing is think about, you know, has there been a material change? So does it materially alter the contract or the nature of the contract? And other things that you might want to think about, are there being multiple successive changes being made which might amount to a material change? Um, are new conditions being introduced which have a, would have affected the initial um, procurement procedure? Um, and does, as I said, as I've mentioned, does it significantly extend or reduce the, uh, the scope of the contract or the framework? So again, you might be able to make that assessment yourself, but if not, we'd of course recommend seeking um, legal advice. And, and, and you can you know, potentially use that, you know, that option there to push back on, on DFID. Um, so if the change is not material, um, there is scope, there's more scope to negotiate and come to agreement with DFID. So first of all, thinking about, you know, have you asked for that technical and commercial justification? And if you have, then thinking about what exactly are the changes which are absolutely necessary to address the change in circumstances that DFID have presented. Um, you might want to think about, you know, can you consider limiting the duration um, or the scope of the modification you suggested? Um, and, and I think really fundamentally, when you're negotiating any changes, you want to look at the contract as a whole and consider the impact of the change on your ability to deliver the contract within the current terms and conditions. So thinking about the, the, the terms of the con contract as a whole. So does the change mean that there's an impact on your ability to deliver the service with value for money, for example? And that's one of the key things that um, DFID is always being concerned about. Um, and you also want to think about whether the, the, uh, the project or the contract, you know, do, do the KPIs, for example, need to be amended to reflect any changes? And then also thinking about the impact on the, your supply chain and, and possibly your supply partners. So does the change mean um, that there's a significant um, increase in value or, do, or decrease in value of the contract, meaning that you need to terminate contracts with your subcontractors? And I think all of this needs to feed into your discussions with, with DFID or the FCDO about the scope of the change. And also have in the back of mind that if you haven't already fulfilled part of the contract or done substantial work, then DFID does have the ability to terminate that agreement um, if um, an agreement can't be uh, reached. So moving on now to um, DFID's um, the termination provisions in the standard terms and conditions. So DFID has, there's two termination provisions. The first one is termination without the default of the supplier. Um, so essentially this allows DFID in its sole discretion to terminate with supplier, giving at least 30 days working notice. Um, DFID doesn't need a reason to use this option, um, but if it does um, exercise under this provision, you do have some um, protection in the sense that um, if there's any costs that have been incurred or, or can't be reasonably avoided by a supplier or if at the point of the notice being given to terminate that you need to expend uh, further costs as a result of the termination, um, then DFIN will reimburse you for, for those costs. So it does give you as a supplier some comfort that they will be able to mitigate it, that you can mitigate any losses incurred in the termination. Um, but again, this requires you to have a really accurate understanding of what your losses would be if the project was, was terminated and, and whether those losses can be reasonably avoided. Um, so I guess, and the other point to make is that there isn't an option for you as a supplier to terminate the agreement with DFID of your own accord. It only gives DFID that option. Uh, the second termination provision is, of course, if there's been a default of the supplier. So DFID can choose to terminate it's agreement with you if there's been a breach of the contract or if, for example, you've um, imposed a substantial modification which would require a new procurement procedure under those regulations we talked about and DFID has the, has the contracting authority 
has the option to terminate. And at this point, I also just wanted to flag that if you are working with other organizations as the lead supplier, um, you need to think about making sure that your subcontracts with your suppliers are reflecting what DFID standard terms and conditions um, cover for bearing and terminating um, the contract. So you should have the ability in your contract with a, with a supplier to terminate um, without, without default. And the notice period, you want to think about that either being the same as, it's, as the option with DFID or perhaps slightly shorter. So now moving on to the uh, DFID accountable grant agreements. Um, you might be aware that there's essentially there's a fundamental difference between a grant agreement and a service contract. So a grant is not a payment in return for services, um, but it's a payment which is freely given by the grantor for a specified purpose. And it's, you know, you'll, you'll find that there'll be specific terms and conditions attached to the use of the grant, so specific monitoring and reporting conditions but it's not um, a payment in exchange for a service. Um, and as a result of that, there's no obligation on the grantor in a grant agreement to pay the amount. Um, in theory, they don't receive anything in return for it. And also the grant can be clawed back if it's not been properly used or if the grant terms have been breached. So the result of that is that the grants, they're not public contracts and so they're not subject to the EU rules on procurement, which we've discussed for the service contracts. And also essentially the funding of the grant agreement um, is almost always subject to the availability of funds from the grantor. And I think if you looked at the, seen the, um, the grant agreement in clause four, what if it does is essentially say that um, the funding amount is subject to revision and is dependent on the fulfillment of the arrangement any revisions to budgets, actual expenditure um, and need, and also the continuing availability of resources to DFID. And I think that's the, that's the provision they'll be looking to rely on if they are making changes to the funding amount. And I said that's within their right as a grantor. Um, and then just looking quickly at the, the termination provisions, um, slightly different in the sense that um, both parties have the ability to terminate a grant agreement with three months written notice. Um, but DFID could also terminate with immediate effect in the um, in circumstances of a material breach or, for example, you've gone into administration. So the grant agreements are slightly different in that they don't give you the outright ability to negotiate the changes um, to the grant as the service contract gives you some flexibility with that. But and that's, you know, as I'm saying, because the grant has been freely given to you <clears throat> with no obligation um, on the funder. So you've got less ability to exercise any influence over the changes. Um, but what I think we wanted to flag at this point was that um, there is some, I think there's some comfort really in thinking that a grant agreement still has contractual force. And so if you as the grantee have acted to your detriment in reliance on the grant agreement, so for example, you've incurred costs or you've started to carry out work, um, then we would argue that a court would find that um, you're entitled to some of this money that has been promised to you under the grant agreement. But again, it's a tricky area of law. So I think if that is something you're willing to, considering going down and taking legal advice again at that point. Or well, you're on mute, Letitia. Thank you, Samara. I'll start again. <laughs> um, as Samara has touched upon, many of DFID's documents are drafted so as to be heavily stacked in DFID's favour. And in fact, one of our delegates has just asked a very pertinent question. Why is termination one-sided in DFID's favour? Are there any contractual principles or standards that should make this mutual? Well, I'm about to um, come on to what NGOs can do. The fact that DFID's documents are drafted to be stacked in DFID's favour does not mean that there's nothing NGOs can do. On the contrary, if you know your documents well, there are in fact many things you can do and many steps you can take to protect yourselves, to assert your rights and to generally level up the playing field. So um, first of all, dealing with variations. Samara has already uh, covered Clause 38, which uh, permits DFID to uh, seek to make variations. But in terms of what NGOs can do, 
uh, you need to become familiar with clause 38.3. Uh, happily for NGOs, clause 38.3 is drafted widely, which is helpful for you all. I've put it up on the slides and I will just run through it because it's a very important clause and at the end I'll, I'll emphasise what are the particularly important bits. In the event that the parties are unable to agree a change to the contract that may be included in a request of a variation or response to, as a consequence thereof, DFID may, one, agree to continue to perform its obligations under this contract without variation, or two, terminate this contract with immediate effect, except, and this is the important bit, where the supplier has already fulfilled part or all of the provision of the services in accordance with this contract, or where the supplier can show evidence of substantial work being carried out to provide the services under the contract. And in such a case, the party shall attempt to agree upon a resolution to the matter. Where a resolution cannot be reached, this matter shall be dealt with under the dispute resolution procedure. Now I'll come on to uh, precisely what the dispute resolution procedure is in a moment. But just to say, this is a clause that DFID often forgets about, or rather this is um, part of the clause that DFID often forgets about. And it really is a weapon in the NGO's arsenal, and it's something you should remember. If you can demonstrate substantial work, um, and I know you all are obliged to keep records, this is the opportunity to then push back against DFID and importantly, take some of the power away from DFID, uh, rather than riding roughshod over you, you can compel them to go to the dispute resolution procedure. And as I'll come on to demonstrate, that really does level up the playing field um, and makes the matter much more um, level sided. So that's variations. What about um, breaches? So if DFID alleges that one of its supply partners has breached the contract, but you dispute it, clause 40.2.2 will help you. Again, it's drafted very widely. It's up on the slides. The supplier shall promptly provide to the DFID any further documentation that DFID requires to assess the supplier's root cause analysis. Importantly, if the parties do not agree on the root cause set out on the draft rectification plan, either party may refer the matter to be determined by an ex in accordance with the dispute resolution procedure. So again, taking some of the power away from DFID and asserting your rights and protecting yourselves by uh, providing you're able to go to a separate procedure to have the matter resolved. So looking now at what the dispute resolution procedure is, it's in clause 47. I'm not going to read out the whole thing, I'm just going to summarise the important um, aspects before I then sort of drill down on the next slide into what they all mean. So first of all, it obliges DFID to negotiate with you. DFID can't just impose anything at all it wants. Um, if you get the matter into the dispute resolution procedure, which actually isn't very difficult to do, DFID is obliged to negotiate with you. And the aim that is expressly stated is to get to a settlement. There's a relatively short time frame. Uh, the supply plant and DFID only have 45 days. And if you're still not satisfied at that point, uh, you can require that the matter goes to a mediation in accordance with CEDA, and I'll come on to uh, the, the details of that in a moment. But just to say, again, you only have a short, relatively short period of time. There's only 90 days allowed for that. And if you're still not satisfied, you can require that the matter goes to an arbitration. Importantly, arbitration is decided by an independent person, usually a specialist in the field, and importantly, his or her decision will be binding on the parties, including on DFID. So just drilling down now into some of um, what that all means and why it's useful to NGOs and why it's really important that you keep this procedure front and centre. First of all, quick timeframes. Um, DFID are 
known to sometimes drag their heels, but if you invoke this clause, they, they've not got a choice anymore. It uh, imposes obligations on DFID, as well as the supplier, of course. It puts DFID to some cost, some time, and quite a bit of aggravation. In my experience of dealing with DFID, they often uh, forget that this clause exists altogether. And simply its existence and you referring to it in your negotiations with DFID can be a very effective bargaining tool to get DFID to come to the table because otherwise you can force them into a process uh, that they probably would rather not be in and that they probably don't have the resources to handle properly. I've already said that it obliges the parties to negotiate. You're not um, at the mercy of DFID. You can um, negotiate with them and you can assert your rights. The express aim of the um, procedure is to reach a settlement. Uh, settlement by its very nature involves compromise on both sides. And importantly, it is intended to avoid legal action Legal action is not only expensive and time consuming, but if you can get to a settlement and avoid legal action, you ought to be able to get the project back on track, which is often uh, the name of the game. If that first round of negotiation doesn't work, uh, you can then force DFID to go to a mediation. And in my experience, DFID doesn't want to go to mediation because it takes a bit of time and it costs a bit of money have the resources. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of what mediation is, um, it's usually a one-day session. Both parties come along usually with a solicitor in tow to, to help them and, and to give them legal advice on the day. You have your own separate rooms and you also have a plenary room where you come together to discuss and you have the use of an independent mediator to facilitate discussion. Importantly, mediation can only ever lead to a voluntary settlement. Nothing is going to be imposed upon you at a mediation. And it's a relatively quick and easy to prepare for procedure. It's much cheaper than legal action and it can be very effective at restoring working relations. I have taken some of the most entrenched disputes to mediation and even if it's taken us to two, three, four o'clock in the morning, we've always got a settlement and the parties usually walk away um, having built bridges and able to get back working together. If, and it's very unlikely in my experience, mediation doesn't work, then you can force DFID to an arbitration. Arbitration is akin to litigation it's unlikely to be much, if any, cheaper, but um, unlike litigation, arbitration is a private procedure. Um, once you go to court, it's a completely public procedure and you lose um, uh, much, uh, much needed confidentiality and privacy. So the benefit of arbitration is you can keep it private. Also, unlike going to court, you can select a specialist arbitrator. We do have some specialist judges um, within our court system, but not many, and you certainly can't chop around for your judge. So um, arbitration has the uh, benefit of being able to select a specialist arbitrator. And importantly, it brings finality, and it's a decision that will be binding on DFID as well as the NGO. So having looked now at uh, the main terms of your agreements and what you can do and what your options are. We wanted um, just to leave you with some practical actions that you can take and things that we think you should bear in mind, particularly over the next few months. You're on mute. Sorry. Um... So the first thing to think about is um, early communication with the FCDO about possible changes. I think importantly, just looking at your projects and flagging up the ones which you think are obvious targets 
um, for cuts or changes. I think some of the ones that have been flagged are those, those longer term projects, um, the four or five year ones, and, and also the ones which I think have a more civil society based focus. I think that was flagged in um, one of the committee meetings. So thinking about that, which are the ones, and, and maybe starting to have that conversation with the FCDO early on about what changes they're envisaging um, to, your, um, to your contracts or funding agreements. Um, also having a look back through the initial procurement and tender documents um, and, and again those special conditions um, specifically for uh, references to variations. Um, I, one of the things that um, with the procurement rules, if there has been a specific reference to a variation in the tender documents, that's one of the things the contracting authority can rely on in, in avoiding that new procurement process because essentially they've already made you aware of what that variation um, is and that avoids them having, needing to go down the procurement route again. So again, taking a look back and familiarising yourself with exactly what was agreed at the, at the outset of the project. Um, and also maybe going forward thinking about um, agreeing with um, the FCDO any specific variations um, in the special conditions so that you've got you're on the front foot and you know what's coming um, what's coming in the future. Um, and I've already mentioned this, but understanding the extent of the variation and the impact on the project. So again, having a really good understanding on the value, uh, the value of the change that they are suggesting and um, what the consequences will be for the whole project um, and those other terms and conditions and also the scope. So looking again at your supply chains um, and your subcontractor roles and, and entering into discussions with them about what the impact will be of this variation so that you can feed that information back to the FCDO and they understand that this is actually a practical impact um, on our finances or on the project if you make this change. Um, I think if you're thinking again about those material changes um, to the contract and whether or not they have suggested a material change. Again, it's really good to take those procurement regulations are quite complicated. There's many exceptions as well. So we've covered, you know, um, a summary of it, but I think it's important to take legal advice um, if you can early on, if you think there's been a material, a material change. It's important in your dealings um, with DFID, particularly you end up in a contentious situation to think strategically and tactically. So um, what do you want to achieve and what are your options to get there? We've already touched upon the importance of getting some legal advice. I do appreciate that legal advice costs money and particularly at the moment budgets are under tremendous pressure. But mistakes over contracts, negotiations and disputes cost far more and it's always more cost effective to get some legal advice um, in the form of a preemptive strike. So I do advise that you take um, legal advice sooner rather than later. And please remember your colleagues at other NGOs you have a tremendous strength in numbers. DFID, I can assure you, will not want to go up against the entire NGO community. I know many personnel at NGOs uh, are members of different forums where you meet to share your know-how and your experiences. And I would recommend, particularly over the coming months, you continue to share with each other um, what you're experiencing what, you, what, what has worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. DFID won't uh, want to go up against all of you. You do have strength in numbers. And also many of the contracts and other arrangements we are talking about are huge and DFID will not, um, or rather the FCDO will not want to re-procure everything um, wholesale. So do keep talking to each other. Um, Thank you very much for listening to us. I appreciate that that was a, a relatively quick and quite detailed canter through quite a lot. Um, at the very end of the session, I'm going to give you our contact details um, and also details of our charity helpline where we're giving all charities um, a completely free 30 minutes. So if you want any sort of clarification or you, you've got anything else you want to raise, feel free to raise that with us. We do now um, have 
time for some Q and A. Um, you very kindly sent in quite a few of your questions in advance of today's session and we're trying to deal with them thematically as far as possible. Um, and you've also been sending some questions to on the chat this morning. We'll, we'll cover as many of those as we can. Again, if, uh, if you've got any questions and don't have time uh, to cover them, feel free um, to send them through on our charity helpline and we'll make sure that they are answered. Uh, so first of all, one of the questions that came through um, in advance, are there any examples of NGOs successfully suing DFID or the FCO over breach of contract? Um, well, technically, um, suing uh, means of taking legal action, and as the contracts show, rather than court proceedings, um, the, the documents um, provide for arbitration rather than going to court. But in any event, um, in my experience, it will just never get that far. If you get some legal advice early on, um, there is no reason why an NGO cannot resolve any dispute with DFID in correspondence, um, particularly if you've got a good solicitor. Um, in my experience, DFID um, don't handle things in the most sophisticated way. Uh, and there's simply no reason to even think about needing to sue DFID. Um, one issue, one sort of connected issue that has arisen recently, some NGOs have come to us um, to ask about a challenge to the merger between DFID and the SFCO, potentially a challenge uh, by a judicial review uh, or perhaps more personally, a challenge to any of the implications um, that arise from it. We are keeping that issue at Bateswell's um, under close review with many of our NGO clients. For now, um, the FCDO has made it clear that there aren't going to be any changes to your contractual um, relations but in my view that's likely to be a short-term arrangement and so it's very much a watching brief. Um, so the second question we've had is um, how might the accountable grant agreement sub clauses be used by or the FCO to save money and um, the easiest things for them to do and what will be harder for them legally? Um, as flagged, I think and the next question alludes to this as well is that some of you have already been asked by the UK A direct funding um, to move your budgets. Um, but essentially there's that clause four that I talked about earlier, which um, allows them to um, amend its funding or budgets um, as, it kind of, as it wishes. And it can rely on that clause four um, to make those changes um, to the budget arrangements. Um, I think that's the easiest thing for them to do is to rely on that existing provision in terms of kind of changing the rest of the terms and conditions of the agreement that would be harder they'd have to issue um, new agreements um, and I'll just take the second <coughs> at the same time as I think they're linked it's about sort of you know how what the letters that you've been given essentially says that you um, there's been no changes to the contract or the funding arrangements but yet you've been asked to make these these cuts and I, if you have a look, there's some FAQ guidance. And essentially what they're saying is they're not asking you to make a cut to your budget, but they're asking you to move that funding, I think, to, to later years. So they're actually not making a change to the actual agreement they've got with you that is asking you to reallocate budgets for the FCDO proportion to, um, to later years. So they're kind of, I guess what they've said in the letter is technically true. They haven't actually asked you to make any, they haven't made any changes to the funding or, agreements with you to those terms and conditions um, but what they have asked is they've relied on an existing provision and asked you to move your budgets for within the years <laughs> so it's a slightly cheeky way of doing it um, but, and as i said i think you will see more changes coming in the future um, this is an, another question that quite a few delegates asked in advance. Should we always push for an official amendment to our agreement for any budget change? In short, yes, you absolutely should push for an official amendment 
not only is that a matter of good governance for your charity, but it will help you enormously if you end up in a dispute with DFID. What you don't want to do is agree something informally, uh, the matter changes hands within DFID, um, and that you find yourself in a difficult situation because nothing was agreed officially. So it will help you if you end up um, in the dispute resolution procedure. It will also help you if you end up negotiating um, in the future because you have a, a, an official track record um, of, of how you've ended up where you have. Um, and ditto if you end up um, having your contract re-procured. But in short, you shouldn't leave yourself exposed by not having an amendment officially agreed by DFID. I think I just add to that there's also a requirement in the terms and conditions that they do provide you with an amendment so that should be something they're doing anyway. Yeah definitely push for it. Um, the fifth question we had was can you dispute um, the termination of a contract with no default? Um, we think that's quite an interesting question because as we've talked about earlier the difference in the termination options for DFID so First of all, if you've got that variation um, that you're disputing with them and you just sort of throw it that you don't agree to, um, DFID has the option to terminate if they can, if, and sort of unless you can provide evidence of substantial work being done. And if you can't come to an agreement with DFID through the variation um, procedure, then you can go down the dispute resolution procedure. So that's probably a good option. But the other option is for DFID to terminate without default. Um, and you know, if they do use this option, then there's no referral to the dispute resolution procedure through a no default uh, termination. So essentially DFID can terminate the contract with you, but it's got to, at that point, it has to buy its way out of the contract. And so it's got to pay the reasonable cost to you um, that you've incurred. Um, I think it's quite common, and maybe Letitia can talk a bit about, you know, it's quite common for suppliers to buy their way out of the contract um, using that provision. Yeah, um, most contracts, not just DFID contracts, do um, allow for a no-fault termination, particularly by the, um, the person providing the funds, um, although they usually can only do so if they give notice or if they make a payment that's previously agreed. So it's right to say that technically you can't challenge um, uh, a termination made on a no fault basis and in fact if I was acting for DFID and they wanted to bring a contentious variation or a contentious termination I would probably advise them to without prejudice to their main position terminate on a no fault basis at the same time so that they had the option to always um, pay the, the sum of money in the notice period required under the under the contract, but in my experience, um, it's actually not very common for DFID to simply terminate on a no no default basis. Um, they are the five questions that we we had in advance. Um, thank you. You've all been sending through your Q and A um, this morning, and um, we've only got about six minutes left. So what we're going to do. Um, Samara and I, if we both click on, I don't know, Samara, if you've been answered. Yeah. We've got two questions there. We're going to go through those two um, questions now. And on, um, on our final slide, I'm going to give you the way to send through any further questions you've got that unfortunately we don't have time to answer in our time limited session. And um, we will make sure you get answers to those questions. So don't worry. If, um, if we don't answer them um, on this webinar, we will answer them subsequently. Um, so first of all, one of the questions, you say that a grant agreement still has contractual force. Can you clarify what level of force? Um, well, I, I can probably take that one if you like. Um, as a, as a matter of very, very basic contract law, something doesn't have to be called a contract to have contractual force. Um, what is required, amongst other things, is for one of the parties with the agreement of the other to do something to their detriment, whether that's work 
or spending money. And just because, because something's called grant doesn't mean that the, the, the entity paying the money um, has all the cards in their favour. If in reliance of that grant arrangement, the other party acts to its detriment, um, then that will create a contractual arrangement which the courts will enforce. And in fact, earlier this year, um, there was an issue with UK aid match and whether DFID was simply going to pull the plug um, and with quite a lot of um, prodding, DFID realised that it wasn't able to do that because many NGOs had acted to their detriment by raising funds. Um, not only had they raised funds, but then they had a potential problem because they had this money um, that they'd fundraised for a specific reason um, and they might then have to, to pay back with all the administrative burden that would impose. And we did advise, and um, I believe this is right as a matter of law, but I'm confident it is because we've settled cases on this basis, that um, as soon as that happens, the paying party is obliged to make the payment because the other side has acted to their detriment. So I'm sorry, that's quite a technical legal answer. Um, again, if you feel that you have acted to your detriment or you've done something in reliance, um, of some sort of promise of funds, then don't just assume that because it's called a grant, you don't have any rights. Speak to your solicitor. I'm, I have no doubt you would be able to bring a claim um, in contract. I think also maybe just to add to that is that um, quite often you'll find, well not often, but sometimes grant agreements can kind of be um, couched in, in wording when actually in fact they're contracts. And so actually getting a good understanding of what actually is a service contract versus what is a grant agreement can give you um, some, some, um, some comfort in, in, in knowing. So, for example, if actually what you've got is a service contract, then those UK procurement rules will, will apply. And I think sometimes we've found that actually what is pretending to be a grant agreement is actually, in fact, a service contract. So just looking, getting a good understanding of that distinction will be helpful as well. And Spar, I don't know if you want to take the other questions there about um, a direct grant. Yeah, a direct. I think I did see something along the lines. Um, there was an FAQ page um, that was sent around about these UK A directs, and I, I have a feeling I can't remember what I'm talking about. But I think they said that they would um, potentially honour the um, one con um, grant agreements that have been awarded. But I agree that if you haven't got a contract in place. Um, and if there's nothing that's been signed, there's probably, you know, there's no legal document, there, there's no contract that's been formed. And again, like I said, it's a grant and not a service contract. So there's no obligation um, unless what we've talked about applies for them to actually provide the funding. Um, but I think, again, it's having those early conversations to try and understand whether or not there is still that intention and then I think probably going back to Tisha's point is have you already started to act to your detriment um, in reliance on um, on the award of the grant uh, and that's something to think about. Thank you um, very much. I'm afraid that um, is the end of our time this morning. We did only have an hour. Um, the slides and the recording of this session are going to be sent to you shortly by bond. Um, I've put on the final slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there <we go. laughs> Thank you. And um, I've put on the final slide just some details that might help you. Um, since the pandemic um, started, Bates Wells has set up a charity helpline for all and any charities, including charities who may be existing clients of ours. And we're offering a free 30 minute um, legal advice. And it is advice. We won't just listen to you. We'll actually try and give you advice in those 30 minutes. So if you've got any questions, and unfortunately we didn't have time um, to answer today, or if on reflection you have any more questions that come to mind, please feel free to send those questions into our 
free charity helpline. If you mark them for my attention, um, I will do my best to get them answered by the most appropriate person. Um, I've also just popped on the slide there my and Samara's email addresses because um, questions aside, if you just want to raise any point with us or have us clarify anything, do drop us an email, we're more than happy to do that. Um, Bond has added to the chat um, its evaluation form and uh, Bond would be very grateful if you wouldn't mind just spending a couple of minutes completing it. Thank you everyone for listening to Samara and me this morning. I hope you found that helpful. And thank you once again to A4ID and to Bond for convening this important session today. Thank you.